Live from Washington, D.C., it's theCUBE, covering AWS Public Sector Summit 2017. Brought to you by Amazon Web Services and its partner ecosystem. Melvin Greer is with us now. He's the Director of Data Science and Analytics at Intel. And Melvin, thank you for being with us here on theCUBE. Good to see you here this Thank morning. you, John and John. I appreciate getting a chance to talk with you. It's great to be here at the AWS Public Sector Summit. Yeah, we make it easy for you. Right? Yeah, John I never John. forget the names. Hey, let's talk just about data science in general and analytics. I mean, tell us about, about uh, give us the broad definition of that, you know, the, the, the elevator speech about what's being done, and then we'll drill down a little bit deeper about Intel and what you're doing with the term in terms of uh, government work and healthcare work. Sure, well, data science and analytics covers a number of key areas, and it's really important to consider the granularity of each of these key areas, primarily because there's so much confusion about what people think of as artificial intelligence. It's uh, certainly got a number of facets associated with it. So we have core analytics, like descriptive, diagnostic, predictive, and prescriptive. This describes what happened, what's going to happen next, why is it happening, and what should I do about it? Yeah. So those are core analytics. The analytics in a different, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sure, in a different tech, we have machine learning, cognitive computing. These, these things are different than core analytics in that they are recognizing patterns and rely on the concepts of training algorithms and then yeah. inference, the use of these trained algorithms to infer new knowledge. And then we have things like deep learning and convolutional neural networks, which use convolutional layers to drive better and better granularity and understanding of data. They often typically don't rely on training and have a large uh, focus area around deep learning and deep uh, um, cognitive skills. And then we, all of those actually line up in this discussion around narrow artificial intelligence. And you've seen a lot of that already, haven't you John? You've seen yeah. where we teach a machine how to play poker, mm -hmm. or we teach a machine how to play Jeopardy or Go. These are narrow AI applications. Yeah. When we think about general AI, however, this is much different. This is when we're actually outsourcing human cognition to a thinking machine at internet yeah. speed. This is amazing, I love that, I love this conversation because a couple things in that, in that thread you just brought up. There's poker, which is great, because it's not just Jeopardy, it's poker's unknown conditions. You don't know the, the, the personality of the other guy, you don't know their cards they're dealing with, so it's a lot, that's like unstructured data and you have to think about that. So, but it really highlights the convergence between supercomputing paradigm and data. And so that really kind of changes the game on data science because the old data warehouse model storing information, pulling it back, has latency. And so we're seeing machine learning and these new apps really disrupting old data analytics models. So I want to get your thoughts on this because, and, and what is Intel doing? Because you guys have restructured things a bit differently, the AI messages out there. As this new revolution takes place with data, so how Intel, are you guys handling that? Intel formed in late 2016 its artificial intelligence product group. And the formation of this group is extremely consistent with our pivot to becoming a data company. So we're certainly not going to be abandoning any of that great performance and, and strong capabilities that we have in silicon architectures. But as a data company, it means that now we're going to be using all of these assets in artificial intelligence, machine learning, cognitive computing, and Intel, in fact, by using this, is really a unique, in a unique position to focus on what we've termed and what you hear our CEO talk about as the virtuous cycle of growth. This cycle of growth includes cloud computing, data center, and IOT. And our ability to harness the power of artificial intelligence and data science and analytics means that Intel is really capable of driving this discussion around cloud computing and powering the cloud, and also driving the work that's required to make a smart, and a connected world, a reality. Our artificial intelligence products group expands our portfolio, and it means that we're bringing all of these, these capabilities that I talked to you that make up data science and analytics. Cognitive, machine learning, artificial intelligence, deep learning, convolutional neural networks, to bear to solve some of the nation's most significant and important problems. And it means that Intel, with its partners, are really focused on the utilization of our core capabilities to drive government missions. Well, give us an example then, uh, in terms of federal government uh, and AI. Um, 
how you're applying that to the operation of what's going on in this giant bureaucracy of a, of a town that we have. <laughs> So one of the things that I'm most excited about is that there's really no agency, almost every federal agency in the U.S. is doing an investigation of artificial intelligence. It started off with this discussion around business intelligence and as you said, data warehousing and other things. But clearly, the government has come to realize that turning data into a strategic asset is important. Very, very, very important. And so there are a number of key domain spaces in the federal government where Intel has made a significant impact. One is in health and life sciences. So when you think about health and life sciences and biometrics, genomics, using advanced analytics for phenotype and genotype analysis, this is where Intel's strengths are in performance and the ability to deliver. We created a collaborative cancer cloud that allows researchers to use Intel hardware and software to accelerate the learnings from all of these health and life sciences advances that they want. Sharing data without compromising that data. We're focused significantly on cyber intelligence. Yeah. Where we're applying threat and vulnerability analytics to understanding how to identify real cyber, real cyber problems and big, big cyber vulnerabilities. We are now able to use Intel products to encrypt from the BIOS all the way up through the application stack. And what it means is, is that our government clients, who typically are hypersensitive around security, yeah. get a chance to have data follow their respective process and meet their mission in a safe and secure way. If I can drill down on that for a second, because this is kind of a really, really sweet area for innovation. Data is now the new Development environment. Bacon is the, it's the oil resource, is the new bacon. It's the resource. It's the gold nuggets. <laughs> so that I was talking with a, yeah, so, it's, no. it's the new bacon. The new bacon. <laughs> data is the new that. bacon. <laughs> no, everyone loves bacon. Everyone loves data. There's a thirst for the data, and there's also <laughs> compliance issues. I'd ask you the role of the CDO, the Chief Data Officer, is now emerging uh, in in companies, and so we're seeing that also at the federal level. I want to get your thoughts on that. But to quote the uh, professor from uh, Carnegie Mellon, who I interviewed last week, said. The problem with a lot of data problems is, is that it's like looking for a needle in the haystack, but there's so, many, so much data now, you have a haystack of needles. So his premise is you can't find everything. You got to use machine learning and AI to help with that. So this is also going to be an issue for the chief data officer, a new role. So is there a chief data officer role? Is there a need for that? Is there a CTO? Who, see, who handles the data? <laughs> yeah, know? so it's this is... It's a tough is, one, because there's a lot of tech involved, but also there's policies. Yeah, so the federal government has actually mandated that each agency uh, assign a federal chief data officer at the agency level. And this person is working very closely with the chief information officer and the agency leaders to ensure that they have ability to take advantage of this large set of data that they collect. Intel's been working with uh, most of the folks in the federal data cabinet who are the CDOs who are working to solve this problem around data and, and analysis of data. We're excited about the fact that we have chief data officers as an entry point to help discuss this hyperconvergence that you described, the technology, yeah. where we have large data sets, we have faster hardware, of mm -hmm. course Intel's helping yeah. to provide much of that, and then better mathematics and algorithms. When we converge these three things together, it's the soup that makes it possible for us to continue to drive artificial intelligence. But that notwithstanding, yeah. federal data officers have a really hard job, and we've been engaging them in, at many levels. We just had our Artificial Intelligence Day in government, where we had folks from um, many federal agencies that are on that cabinet, and they shared with us directly how important it is to get Intel's input on both hardware, hardware performance, mm -hmm. but also on software. Yep. When we think about artificial intelligence and the chief data officer or the data scientist, this is likely a different individual than the person who's buying our silicon yeah. architectures. Yeah. This is a person who's focused primarily on an agency mission and is looking for Intel to provide hardware and software capabilities that drive that mission. I got to ask you, from an Intel perspective, you guys are doing a lot of innovating things. You have a great R&D group, but also the silicon you mentioned is important. And you know, software's eating the world, but data's eating software. So what's next? What's eating data? We believe it's memory and silicon. So one of the trends, is in, trends in big data is real-time analytics is moving closer and closer to memory and then now silicon. 
you look at some of the security paradigms with data involved, you're seeing silicon implementations, root security, malware, firmware kind of innovations. This is an interesting trend, because if software gets onto the silicon to the level that there's better security, you have fingerprinting, all kinds of technologies, how is that going to impact the analytics world? So if you believe that they want faster, lower latency data, it's going to end up in the silicon. John, you described exactly why Intel's focused on the virtuous cycle of growth. Because as more cloud-enabled data moves itself from the cloud through our 5G networks and out to the edge in IoT devices, whether they be autonomous vehicles or drones, this is exactly why we have this continuum that allows data to move seamlessly between these three areas and operationalizes mm -hmm. the core missions of, of government as well as provides a unique experience yeah. that most people can't even imagine. You likely saw uh, the NBA Finals, you talked about Kevin Durant, and you saw there the Intel 360 de demonstration Love where you're, you're able to see how through different camera angles the entire play is unfolding. That is a, a prime example of how we use back-end cloud hyper-connected yeah. uh, uh, hardware with networks and edge devices where we're pushing analytics closer and closer to the By the way, the that's edge. a real life media entertainment example of an IOT situation where it's at the edge of the network, AKA stadium. I mean, we geek out on that as well as the Amazon has the MLB thing. Amy Jesse knows I love that because it's like, we're both baseball fans. We're excited about it too. We think that along with autonomous vehicles, we think that this whole concept of experiences rather than capabilities and technologies. But most people don't know important. that that example of basketball takes massive amounts of compute. I mean, to make that work at that level, but this is the In CG, near real time. This is the CG environment we're seeing with gaming culture. The people are expecting an interface that looks more like Call of Duty or you know Minecraft than they are like a Windows desktop machine that what we're used to. That's why we we're that's, that's great. That's why we say we're building the future, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you, you touched on something you said a little bit ago that a data officer in the federal government has got a tough job. Yes, big job. What, what's the difference between private and public sector? Somebody who's handling the same kinds of responsibilities but has different you know, compliance pressures, different enforcement pressures, and, and those kinds of things. So somebody in the public space, what are they facing that maybe somebody on the other side of the fence is not? All data officers have a tough job, whether it's about cleansing data, being able to ingest it. What we talk about when you describe this needle in a, need, a haystack of needles, is the need and ability to create a hyper-relevancy to data. Because hyper-relevancy is what makes it possible for personalized medicine and precision medicine. That's what makes it possible for us to do uh, hyperscale personalized retail. This is what makes it possible to drive new innovation. It's this hyper-relevancy. And so whether you're working in a highly regulated environment like energy or financial services, or whether you're working in the federal government with Department of Defense and intelligence agencies or um, deep, deep space exploration like at NASA, you're still solving many data problems that are in common. Yeah. Of course, there are some differences, right? When you work for the federal government, you're a steward of citizens' data. That adds a different level of responsibility. There's a legal framework that guides how that data is handled. Well, trust opposed, is important. That's right, as opposed to just a regulatory and legal one. But when it comes to artificial intelligence, all of us as practitioners are really focusing on the legal, ethical, and societal implications associated with the implementation of these advanced technologies. Quick question to end this segment. I know we're a little running all over time, but I want to get this last point in. And this is something that we've talked on theCUBE a lot, me and Dave Vellante debating, because data is very organic innovation. Um, you don't know what you're going to do until you, you get into it. A little alchemy, if you will. But trust and security and policy is a top-down, slow-down mentality. So also often in the, in the past, it's been restricting growth. So the balance here that you're getting at is, how do you provide the speed and agility of real-time experiences while maintaining all the trust and secure requirements that have slowed things down? <laughs> you mentioned um, a very important uh, topic there, John, and in my last book, of 21st century leadership, I actually describe this concept as ambidextrous leadership. This concept of being able to do operational excellence extremely well and focus on delivery of core mission, and at the same time, 
be in a position to drive innovation and look forward enough to think about how, not where you are today, but where you will be going in the future, this ambidexterity is really a critical factor when we talk about all leadership today, not just leaders in government or just uh, people who work That's focus on artificial intelligence. That's multi multidisciplinary too, right? I mean, That's right. That's right. That's the DevOps ethos, that's the cloud. <laughs> Move fast. I mean, Mark Zuckerberg had the best quote with Facebook. Move fast and break stuff. Up until the time he had about a billion users, then it changed to move fast and, move fast and be secure yeah, yeah. and don't, reliable. Don't break anything. Well, he, yeah, he got point, the, right. well, they understood. They, right. You can't just break stuff. At some point, you got to move fast and Give be a, reliable. A, a secure experience. One of five books, by the way, I want to mention. <laughs> That's right, and I'm working yes. on my sixth and seventh now, but yeah. The, the, and, and also the Managing Director of the Greer Institute of Leadership and Management. So you're, you've written now almost seven books. You're running this leadership. You're working with Intel. What do you do in your spare time, Bill? My wife is a chef. <laughs> and <laughs> A so lot. I get a chance to enjoy all of the great Excellent. food she cooks, and I have two young sons, and they keep me very, very busy, believe me. <laughs> I think you're busy enough. Thanks for being on theCUBE. I very much appreciate Good it. Good to have you with us here Thank at the you. AWS Public Sector Summit. Back with more coverage live here on theCUBE from Washington, D.C., right after this.